Live from Stanford University, it's theCUBE, covering the Women in Data Science Conference 2017. Hi, welcome back to theCUBE. I'm Lisa Martin, live at the Women in Data Science Conference, second annual here at Stanford University, hashtag WIDS2017. Fortunate to be joined next by Mariah Meyer, who is an assistant professor at the University of Utah in the School of Computing. Mariah, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. It's great to have you here. You're a speaker at this event this year. Yes. Tell us a little bit about how you got involved in WIDS and what excites you about being able to speak to this very passionate, invigorating audience. Yeah, so um, I I got an invitation from one of the organizers, seems like quite some time ago, and when I looked into the conference, it just looked fantastic. Um, I was so impressed with the speakers they had last year and the speakers for this year. It's a really amazing powerhouse of, of a community here. Um, and you know the fact that it's a great technical conference that, oh, just happens to be all women. Um, it's, it, it was pretty awesome. I was pretty flattered to get um, invited. And, and the, the sort of, uh, the energy in there is really awesome. And it is different, it feels different than other technical conferences. I, I completely agree. I love that, that you talked about, um, you know, just the community, because that's really what it is. And I think some of the, just the vibe that, that you can feel sitting here is one of excitement. It's mm -hmm. one of passion. Mm -hmm. And uh, of, of women who have been in, in this industry for a very long time in computer science, and then those, those young girls who are looking for inspiration. I think it's very symbiotic, right? They're learning from you, but I think you're probably also learning from them. D definitely. Um, you know, I find that every time I, ha I'm, I present my work to another group of people, a different community, I, I, I always have to come up against you know what my own assumptions are about how easy or not it is to understand the kind of work I do, and you know I, I personally find it just so important to communicate clearly. It's probably partly why I do the work that I do, um, but I learn a lot every time I give a talk at a place like this. Oh, outstanding! Well, speaking of your talk, um, your research is in visualization systems. Share with us what you shared with the audience today: goals, outcomes, current outcomes of your visualization research. Mm -hmm. So my my research passion is around helping people make sense of complex data. Um, I, I've particularly done a lot of work with scientists, particularly that in, in biology, where there's just been this amazing explosion of data and people are just trying to wrap their heads around you know, what they have and what kinds of amazing discoveries they're sitting on. Um, and But you know, it's really interesting, we've gotten so good at creating data, but then that's wonderful, but if you can't make sense of it, who cares? Right. Um, so I, I have this incredibly privileged position where where I get to go and work with people who are at the cutting edge of their field and learn about this amazing work that they've been spending their lifetime on. And then I help them, you know, I design tools with them um, that you know, oft sometimes changes even the way that they're thinking about the problem. So it's incredibly satisfying um, and it's, it's very much in the, the spirit of team science and, and it, it, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And so that's, I was talking about um, just some of the basics behind how do you create effective visualizations which for me, is, uh, it also draws heavily on the notion of how do we collaborate effectively? How do you get at people's deep needs when it comes to making sense of data when they oftentimes can't articulate it themselves? I, I refer to it as data counseling because it feels very much like uh, you know, I talk with people who have problems but they can't articulate it. So I ask them <laughs> lots of questions to help them uncover you know, the root of their, their problems. Right. Um, and that's basically what I do. I love um, that and data counseling. Yeah, that's fantastic. Y yeah, and then and you know and then you use what you discover in order to design tools. So share with us a little bit about the courses that you teach in computer science at the University of Utah. Um, yeah, so uh, they're, I teach a graduate level um, visualization course, and it is just about the basic foundational principles we have behind perception and cognition and what that means for how we encode information, and then also um, the process of how do you evaluate visualizations effectively. Um, and so, so it's a really wonderful uh, course where we have people from actually all across campus, so a lot of people are bringing problems that they have in other fields and trying to learn how to be more effective in their own exploration with visualizations. Um, and then uh, at the undergrad level, I actually teach our second semester programming course. So these things are worlds apart. Um, so this is one of our you know, large 200 person um, introduction to data structures and algorithms. Okay. What are some of the things that are inspiring, we'll talk about your graduate students for a moment. What are some of the things that you find are inspiring them to want to understand data in this way? Is it because they were kids that 
grew up in STEM programs or they were they just had a computer since the time where they were little or, or are there other factors that you're finding that are really drivers of them wanting this type of education? Yeah, so the, the, the students that, that have that I work with directly I think kind of fall into two camps. Um, one camp is they're a sort of non-traditional computer scientist where, you know, they, they enjoy the engineering, they enjoy the programming, um, but they also really enjoy people and are passionate, are passionate about making a difference. They also really enjoy the interaction that we have to go through in trying to understand what someone, need, someone needs. Um, and, you know, there's also a design component. It's really fun to get to create things that feel good and look good. Um, so, so that's definitely one class. So it's, it's the sort of non-traditional computer scientist. Um, the other class, um, I have a couple of students who um, come from like a science background who love science but find that they like building things more than they like doing the science itself. And visualization is, is kind of a, a, a wonderful place in the middle where you can be part of science but doing the making and building that we do in computer science as opposed to doing the, the sort of experimentation and studying that you do as a scientist. And that was definitely for myself, I have a background in science and, and that's what really drew me when I discovered computer science and visualization itself. What are some of the traditional skills that a, a good educated computer scientist needed maybe five years ago and how are you seeing that change? Are there new behavioral traits or skills that really are gonna be essential for these people going forward? Yeah, I think, um, you know, especially in, this, in the space of data science and remembering that at the end of the pipeline, there's a person sitting there either bringing their knowledge to bear or that you're trying to tell a story to from data. Um, I think w one, one trait is, is the idea of, of having empathy and being able to connect with people and to just understand that as technologists, we're not all of us, but largely creating technology for people. And um, that's something that I think has traditionally been undervalued and perhaps mm. a little bit filtered out by perceptions of what a computer scientist is. But as technology is becoming more u ubiquitous and people are understanding the impact that they could have, I think it is bringing in a different group of people that have different motivations for coming to the field. What are some of the, as your graduate students um, finish their education and go on to different industries. What are some of the industries that you're seeing that they're using their skills in? Um, yeah, so a lot of it is getting hired in companies that their core their core product that they develop isn't necessarily a piece of technology, but they've they're using data now um, to really understand their business needs and things like that. Uh, uh, I have a you know a student right now who's actually at a government organization in D.C. Um, working with some amazing global health. Um, uh, specialist, but you know these are you know midwives and social workers, and they don't have the the deep um, skills in data analysis. And so there's opportunities for people in visualization and in data science to go and really make an impact in in a whole variety of interesting fields. And that's actually one of the things that I always love to tell undergrads who come to talk to me about, like, oh, should I do computer science? Um, and the thing I love most about it is that whatever your passion is in life, whether it's medicine or whether it's music or whether it's skiing, there is a technology problem there. And so if you have those skill sets, you can go and, and apply it to anything that you care deeply about. I couldn't agree more. That's such an important message to get out. I mean, every company, we're sitting here in Silicon Valley where car companies are technology companies. Every company these days, Walmart, is a technology company. I think that's an important message for, for those kids to understand following their passion. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that that can be repeated enough mm -hmm. because you're right, whatever it is, there's a technology component to that. So mm -hmm. with that said, let me ask you, what were some of your passions when you were younger in school? You mentioned a sci your science degrees, but what were some of the things that, that really helped or maybe people shape your career and where you are today? Yeah, I, uh, growing up, um, I was, yeah, my dad's a scientist, my mother's an artist, and so there's definitely Art both and science, of those. Art and science, oh yes. Yeah, influences <laughs> of both, and I really wanted to be an astronaut, but it turns out I get really motion sick, so I had to oh, give up that dream. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I studied science, but at the same time, um, my mom always had me creating and doing things with her in her studio, and um, so I think I found this love of just the, you know, being able to make something and how satisfying that is. Um, and so th I think that was influential. And then also um, when I was in college, uh, I, I was uh, an astronomy major and I had the opportunity to take lots of electives, which in hindsight I think was really important because it let me explore many things. Um, and I found myself taking a lot of um, women's, women's studies classes 
and what was interesting about that is just the, the way that you think and problem solve in a discipline like that where it's all critical analysis. That sort of coupled with the deep analytics that I was, you know, skills I was learning in, in physics um, made for this just really interesting, you know, I think multiple, gave me perspectives to look at problems in multiple different ways. And, and I think that that's been really important for being able to bring that, you know, that, that suite of perspectives to how we solve problems. It's not all just quantitative and it's not just all qualitative, but it's really a nice mixture of both that gets us to good places. Absolutely, so I think that zigzag career path that you're sounding like you're mm -hmm. talking about, I know I had, had one as well, gives you perspectives that you wouldn't even have thought to seek yes. had you not been on these trails. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's great advice that, that people that are, either whether they're in your classes or they're being able to listen to you here, should be able to know that it's okay to try things. Yes. Yes, exactly. And I think back to the person I was when I was, say, 18. I didn't, you know, I didn't know, you know. And, and I think that the one sort of constant in my career trajectory has been just, wow, this thing looks really interesting. I don't know where it's going to go, but I'm going to follow that path. And inevitably, if it's something that catches your attention, there's going to be something interesting that can come out of it. Um, and I think sort of letting go of this, this, this need to have everything defined from day one and instead following your passions is, you know, that's the theme I've heard over and over again from the speakers in here too. Absolutely. Be, be, don't be afraid to fail is one of the themes that has come out from this morning. Um, and Diane Green, SVP of Google Cloud, who was in the morning keynote, had even said, don't be afraid to get fired. And I mean, could mm -hmm. you imagine your parents saying that to you? Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't, but it's also something that just shows you that there is um, there's tremendous opportunity right. in many different disciplines and domains yes. for this and type. And by the way, if you have a technical computer science background, you can always find another job. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is true. So what's next on your plate in terms of research? What are you looking forward to the rest of 2017? Um, wow. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, was that too big of a question? <laughs> uh, yeah, um, we have a couple of really interesting um, problems around color, um, around some new tools for helping designers and journalists work with data. Um, mm. And I think also, I'm, you know, I'm starting to think about trying to, to focus more on K through 12 education and trying to understand what some of the roadblocks are to getting computer science to a younger um, community of people. In Utah, we have a lot of rural populations. Okay. We also um, have uh, Native American reservations. And so I think there's some really interesting challenges with getting computer science into those communities. And, so I'm sort of thinking about working with some folks to try to understand more about that. That's fantastic. I mean, y you, you bring up a good point that kind of depending on where you are, here we are sitting at Stanford University, <laughs> one of the preeminent universities in the world, and there's a tremendous amount of technology um, and resources available. But then you look at mm -hmm. really, you know, the needs of, of communities in Utah, and they need people like you to help go, you know, we have, we have a challenge here, we need to solve that, because that's part of the next generation mm -hmm. of the people that are here speaking at these types of events. Right. Absolutely a critical problem. Well, Mariah, thank you so much for being thank on the Thank you for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure. We wish you the best of luck with your big plans for 2017. Thanks. And hopefully we'll see you next time. Great. And we thank you for watching theCUBE again, Lisa Martin, live at Stanford University at the Women in Data Science, a second annual conference. Stick around, we've got more, we'll be right back.